Good evening, everyone. Welcome to another beautiful day with us on Live with Lloyd, where the joy of numerology is the joy of learning and enlightenment. I'm your host, astro-numerologist Lloyd Strayhorn, on this Monday, the 21st day of March of 2022, which is springtime. We've now changed zodiac signs, too. As you see, on the screen will be my guest that will be featured in just a couple of moments after we do the cosmic forecast for today. Um, because of our uh, technical problems in the visual sense, we have the audio of my distinguished guest, so you should be able to hear him loud and clear. Uh, without that further ado, we'll get into it. We're going to ask a lot of questions, and maybe for those of you in the world of journalism or thinking about being a journalist, uh, you can kind of get a kind of like an inside tip as to what to expect in the world of journalism. But in the meantime, though, um, this is the forecast for today, uh, Monday, uh, March 21st. The sun is now in Aries. So yesterday was in Pisces. Now officially for the next three weeks and change, the sun will be in the sign of Aries. The moon is in the fixed sign of Scorpio. It's a nine universal month, a three universal week. Uh, three universal days. So all the threes are in alignment today. And those signs that are likely to be favored will be Sagittarius and Pisces. And those that are born on the 3rd, the 12th, the 21st, or the 30th of the month uh, are likely to be also the beneficiary of today's cosmic forecast. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to I'll put this off a second, this. Okay. And here we go. Hi, everybody. Uh, good evening. Um, there's a gentleman I'm about to bring on that I've been knowing a number of years, a very extraordinary gentleman, but as far as I'm concerned, all my guests are extraordinary, but this gentleman is an exception because he falls outside of the kind of guests I normally have on, which is normally metaphysically related, but he is he plays a very important role because very rarely does one get up in the morning or afternoon or retire in the evening without watching a newscast or hearing a newscast. Well, this distinguished friend of mine, Gary G-Man Toms, has definitely been in a world all his own uh, to be a journalist and whatnot. So we're gonna go back and forth with me and then his image, and then hopefully that will get it. And so in other words, I'd like to introduce to you, Gary G-Man Toms. Gary, how are you, sir? Good evening, Lloyd. Thank you very much for having me. I really appreciate being here. Okay, and listen, for those of you, if you cannot hear clearly, just hit me up on the chat, please. But I think you should be able to hear very, very well. And to all of those that are tuning in, Antonia, Lynn, Turner, Debri, Debs, uh, bonjour, greetings, everything, and good evening to everybody. Um, so anyway, somebody says, yes, hey, Lloyd and Gary G-Man Toms. Well, you can tell we're in New York City, uh, right, Gary? <laughs> From all the fire engines. Oh, yeah, this oh, is yeah. this would not be New York City if we didn't have a little drama up in this piece, okay? But anyway, oh, yeah. anyway, though, Gary, how did you get into the world of journalism in the first place? Who were the people that inspired you to do what you do? Well, my journey into journalism actually began when I was very, very young. Um, it all started when I grew up in the household that I grew up in, which was, um, unfortunately, an extremely violent household. Um, my mother was physically and emotionally abused, as was I from time to time. And to escape, I would do one of two things. I would run to my room, close the door, and I would either read uh, something back in the day that we had, which was called Encyclopedia Britannica, mm -hmm. uh, and a royal book encyclopedia. I would read them backwards and forwards to kind of try and escape when I heard my mother being brutalized and beaten and was when she was screaming. And the other thing that I was basically during the week, but during the weekends, what I would do is I would watch the Saturday morning cartoon lineup on CBS, like most, most kids did. But what 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 ended up happening was at the end of the cartoon segments there were two shows in particular that i became fascinated and i dare say obsessed with one was a series hosted by walter cronkite which was called you are there where he did it like it was a news show a news format but what it did was it re reenacted it reenacted historical events 
but it did it like it was a news broadcast, which I always thought, which I thought was fascinating, even for a kid. And in the other, and in the other thing that I would do is I would watch a show called uh, In the News with Christopher Glenn. And the very first segment that I ever watched involved Skylab, which was NASA's very first space station, which was launched in 1973, and uh, it lasted for about 24 weeks. And I was riveted to that coverage because it showed people in space and what they were doing up in, up in the universe also captivated my attention. So it was those two situations that basically, I guess, put me on the trajectory to wanting to learn more about the field and what journalism was and what its overall purpose was. And later, subsequently, what happened was I ended up working for a publication in the Rockaways, Rockaway, New York, called The Wave of Long Island. And basically, I had just walked in one day and introduced myself to the publisher, who at the time was the late Leon Locke, God rest his soul. And I basically walked up to him and said, I can write my ass off. And if you give me the opportunity to prove it, you won't, you won't regret it. And he kind of, kind of looked at me and he kind of like smirked, you know, and he said, I tell you what, kid, I'll give you two weeks. And that two weeks turned into eight years. <laughs> because eventually, eventually I went from becoming the uh, a columnist to becoming a reporter. And then ultimately the publication's first and only black editor in 110 years. Seriously? Yes. And that's what pretty much really put me on the trajectory to journalism. I think, I think that's amazing. And since then, so how long have you now been in the journalism field? And then you named a couple of people that were your idols, such as Les Payne. And um, and others, uh, Walter Cronkite, Edward R. Murrow, uh, Ed right. Bradley, Max right. Robinson. Uh, yes. These were were news giants. When I guess news was news. <laughs> I, I appreciate that, and I respect you saying that because there are a lot of people who feel that the news industry has taken a turn; it's not for the better. Um, but yes, I would classify it as the highlight of the news industry or the news period. Because all of the aforementioned were, as you said, they were giants in the industry and well respected. And the reason was because they all brought a sense of what I would describe as authenticity to journalism. Whenever they took to the airwaves and they spoke, not only did they speak in a commanding way, but they spoke in a manner, as in the case of Walter Cronkite, in a manner in which made you feel that you can trust that the information that was being conveyed um was sincere that it was authentic and that it was legitimate which um unfortunately today a lot of people don't share that viewpoint of journalism you know i was going to ask you man and you're in my head what is the difference today about this so-called 21st century journalism versus the old days of journalism when it was about really getting to the truth whereby nowadays 21st century no matter which station you turn it seemed like you heard the same thing they just said it another way, but on a different channel. And is it me or what? No, I think you make a very valid point. And I would say that the major difference is, and my this opinion was formulated basically with some assistance. Um, let's say what, 1999, 2000, I met with Abe Weston, who was the former executive producer for ABC News. And I asked him a question during a forum that was held somewhere in Manhattan, the, uh, the Freedom Forum, I believe it was. But it was basically a press-related event. And I stood up and I asked him a question right along those lines. And he basically had laid out that the, the change occurred when the news industry decided to not only engage in informing the public, but entertaining the public. In other words, news became infotainment, and the emphasis was placed on making money and generating revenue, okay, as opposed to doing what I call in-the-weeds journalism, going deep, getting the story, getting the sources, presenting the information to the public in a way that they understand it but and be more well informed about what's going on in their communities or in the in, in the country that took a turn when advertising became involved because once advertising became involved then it became about it was a race for ratings 
Who's got the better ratings? Who's got the better stories? Who's got the more entertaining story? So that's when you start to see these new segments where more and more show uh, focus was placed on celebrity interviews and things of that nature. And so for me, I think, and according to Mr. Weston, that's when the transition began to take place. And it's only grown since then, because as you come to see, we now live in a culture and a society, including the news industry, that celebrates celebrity. What about this? Isn't is that where the notion came from? If it bleeds, it leads. I would dare say yes. And but here's the thing: it's not just or limited to broadcast media or network or cable television news. It is. It was also a thing, and it may still be a thing with some publications. But let me be clear in saying this: publications that practice that don't practice ethics, honor, and integrity. What do I mean? There are some publications, because I work for one, and it pains me to say this, but the truth is the truth. I'm not here to lie to anybody. And like I said, I don't pull punches. You know this about me. That's why you're on this show, buddy. (laughs) I work for a publication where, and I can outside a situation to kind of sum up my point. I lived in an area in Far Rockaway, New York, Far Rockaway, Queens, and there were a number of shootings that still are to this day. And I never forget there was a time when there was a shooting in an area called the uh, Red Front Houses, which is where I grew up. And I, being that I was the only black journalist on the staff at the time, I said, all right, you guys are not going to go. I'll go. Because clearly they didn't want to put themselves in that type of situation. And I feared nobody and no thing. So I said, all right, I got this. Traveled to Fort Rockaway. Met with the fam with the where the went to the site where the alleged shooting took place, and was going to meet with the family. Unfortunately, it was a shooting where the person was killed. Got the story, spoke to people, spoke to police officers, came back. Management had a problem with the fact that I didn't get a picture of the body that was laying on the ground. Seriously? And I said, "Okay, check this out. That's not what I went there for. I went there to get the story. I got." who, what, when, where, and how, who, what, when, where, and why, and decided to come back. The family was right there. I did not feel it was appropriate to walk up and just start taking pictures of bodies so you guys can plaster it on your front page and sell papers. I said, some things you have to, some things are just inappropriate, and I wasn't willing to do that. If that's what you wanted, then you should have sent another reporter down here to do that. I have my information, you can run with the story, or you're not run with it, the choice is yours. They opted not to publish the report without the photo, to their credit. Really? But but yes, so to answer your question, yes. It is very much a common practice, unfortunately, to this day, if if it bleeds, it leads. The more sensational, the more horrific, the more horrendous, let's run with it. No, and there's a way, I'm sorry, there's a way to run those stories, but you've got to do it in context. Okay, you can't just throw it out there, you know, without putting anything in the context and just, you know, celebrating gore, blood and gore. That's not going to work, and it shouldn't work. We're better than that, especially as news people. Well, I think that's, uh, that's amazing looking at... Um how how things have happened. And by the way, uh, back in uh, 2001 with the 9-11 tax and the crash of flight uh, 587, in fact, one of my client's wife was on that flight when it crashed. Uh, it made you a principal journalist and prevented you from becoming a news whore, as you call it. What do you mean, yes. buddy? That was probably the, because Okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna really be honest here and convey something that's never been conveyed in my twenty plus years of doing this. Oftentimes when I've spoken or been called to speak at schools or, or other settings to speak to young people, it's guaranteed that someone's gonna stand up and ask me, Where did you go to school for journalism? Uh, do you have a journalism degree? And because ethics, honor, and integrity are important to me, no matter who I'm interacting with, young or old, mm-hmm. I'm the, I've always told the kids, 
all in all honesty, I don't have a journalism degree, nor did I go to school for journalism. I was an English major, political science minor. My goal all of my life has always been to be a screenwriter because I have several scripts to this day that I've tried to get produced in Hollywood. That's my first love. Writing, creative writing is my first love. Once I got involved in journalism, I started to realize what a difference my reporting can make and has made. And so that's why I stuck with that. But in terms of 9-11, the attacks on 9-11 and the crash of Flight 87, I, it helped me in the sense that, as I said, it prevented me from becoming a news whore. And by that, I mean, when 9-11 hit, I'm sorry, poor choice of words. When 9-11 occurred, Far Rockaway or the Rockaways lost an enormous number of people who either worked in the towers or were police officers and firefighters, both of which were huge, comprised huge sectors of the Rockaway community, the west end of the community, okay? Mm -hmm. So when the families of the victims came into the Wade office to meet with us, they came because we had to write their obituaries. And I was charged with the task of writing, I'd say, about 70 to 75 percent of those obituaries. Some were made emailed into us. Some were submitted at the front desk and the person left because it was just too difficult for them to stay and provide all of the details regarding the loved one that they lost. But then there were those who came in, sat down with me one on one. And, I, and like I said, there were over 50 in total. And when you're looking into these people's eyes and you realize that not only did they lose someone that they dearly love, they're entrusting you to tell their story in print form and to do that as accurately as possible. And when they're doing this and they can relay this information to you with tears streaming down, you realize you have a responsibility to not only them, but the person that they lost. So in that sense, that's one example that I can cite when I say those, that incident prevented me from becoming a news worker because there are people out there, there are, and I'm, yeah, I'll say it, there are reporters and journalists out there, unfortunately, who rush to either be first, they'll rush to put a story together, either without having all of the factual information, or they'll just be totally, print something that's completely erroneous and fictitious, as, is, as was the case of Jason Blair at the New York Times. And that's all, that, that helps no one, okay? So, I, and so when I was put in that situation, it helped shape me. The same with the crash of Flight 587, okay? And here's what's, what people, a lot of people, that I share this with are stunned to find out. 9-11 occurred and we were dealing with that. We were still trying to, to the news office as well as the Rockaway community was still trying to come to terms with what had happened, what had happened, what was happening and what was to come after and, and what would be the aftermath because people were scared, people were confused and people were still concerned about whether or not we were gonna be subject to another terrorist attack. Well, two months later, just two months after the 9-11 attacks, Flight 587 crashed directly in the Rockaway community. So we hadn't even effectively dealt with 9-11 yet, and now we've got a major, another major catastrophe in the span of two months. Now, when I say most people were shocked and did not realize, they're stunned to find out this particular point, during both tragedies, there were only four people working at the newspaper to cover the tragedies. My managing editor, Howard Schwab, myself, my sports editor, Elio Velez, and there was an intern, Miriam Rosenberg. Okay, Miriam was a part-timer, and Eric, I mean, I'm sorry, Elio, you know, God bless his soul, he, I mean, he's a good guy, but he's a sports editor, he really didn't do hard news. But to his credit, he did the best that he could with helping Howie and I craft stories and craft stories. But 
the majority of that fell on Howie and myself to cover not just the west end of the peninsula, but the east end of the peninsula. Howie took the west, I took the east. That's two people with the part-time help of two others reporters that were working on staff. To this day, people find that very hard to believe because Howie and I, every week at the Wave, we're putting out anywhere from 90 to 100 pages for a weekly, which was unheard of at the time. And it was mostly hard news. There was no filler. There was no fluff. We had your advertising because you have to have advertising. But the majority of the news that we were publishing, or that mostly that got published, was hard news. And to this day, when Howie and I have conversations, we feel that that period when we were working at the Wave, we both did some of the best work that we've ever done, and really did our best to help to help tell the stories of the people that had suffered in Rockaway, and that was pivotal for me going forward because it taught me the importance of getting the story right and making sure make, taking every possible precaution to make sure that you get all the information and all the facts right going forward especially if people are trusting you to do so well i can tell you this i was i have been on the other end or the other side of your interviewing process you've interviewed me for a couple of segments uh, such as uh, the re-election of uh, Barack Obama in 2012 and some others. And one thing about you, you are extremely thorough. Uh, you checked me on a couple of points. Um, <laughs> but but that's how you roll, though. That's yeah. why I have such a tremendous, tremendous respect for what you do. And in fact, you. Um, you know... You know, one of the things is that people don't know is there were many stories you broke on your own that made yes. the national press. Can you? I mean, there have been many. Okay, would you like to highlight just a few? Sure. Um, well, coming out of the box, and I, I like to use this example because it's funny. My uh, my former managing editor, I call him Big Boss Man, Howie Schlock. Uh, I, I already referenced him earlier. Shout out to you, Howie, if you're listening. Um, he had, he said, kid, you knocked it out. You, you hit a home run your first time up. And what he was talking about was the very first story that I broke uh, at the way the big story um, as associate editor was involved CVS and the CVS franchise, but this particular um, Rockaway location. What had happened was, real briefly, we had found out or information was brought to us that the increment of the readouts or the printouts that they used back then because the person would go in and get the prescription filled and everything was kept in the computer and eventually the information was purged from the computer via a printout and then it was dumped, put in a dumpster and supposed to be secured and eventually would be carted away this particular occasion somebody came to us with documents and said do you see this and when i reviewed the documents they were CVS printouts, and they had the medication the person was on. And this is the members of the Rockaway community. The pages were endless, and this bin, this garbage bin, was full of them. Names of the places, names, addresses where they live, social security numbers, the, medic the medication that they were taking. I mean, this was bad, and it was fully exposed to the public for anybody to just walk up, grab, and become a victim of identity theft, among other things. I broke the story, and it was eventually picked up by the um, the dailies. But what also happened was I contacted the executive director, one of the executive directors for the chain, for the franchise, and informed them of what happened, sent them the story. And ultimately, what ended up happening was they developed a whole new system for destroying confidential information um, that's given by customers when they come in. They developed a whole new system for destroying the information, including carting it off and sending it to warehouses where it can be properly destroyed. They did this not just at the Rockaway location, they did it across the country, every CVS location. Then after that, 
there were several stories involving the NYPD, one of which was how the NYPD was conducting warrant searches during what's called aided calls. Aided calls are medical distress calls. So in other words, what I had discovered, and this information was given to me by people who were either on the job or working within the NYPD, who said that they were quote unquote, and excuse how I put this, I'm just quoting what I was told. They said, we're tired of the bullshit. And we're coming to you because we've been following you for quite some time. We know that you're fair. We know that you're accurate. This is what we have for you. And they gave me information. They gave me documentation to confirm everything that they were saying. And I ran the story. And according to those sources, policies and procedures were later changed where that was not, where they were no longer doing that. So you mean, so you mean that if a person was being, got a call for help, and they arrived at that person's location, home, or whatever. They also ran to see if there were outstanding warrants or whatever it is you're trying to say. That is correct. And are no you serious? Has, and no crime had been committed in the process. That is correct. The reports are still on the old news site, and we'll get to that a little later because they weren't there for quite some time. But they were, they re, they were placed back up. But we'll get into that a little later. Um, and then there were several reports I've done on the New York State, New York City nursing home system uh, with, with the help of Mr. Jack Halpern, who has made several appearances on my podcast at G-Man Interviews. Um, and Mr. Halpern approached me because, according to him, he'd gone to a number of mainstream news publications with the information that he had had, but for whatever reason, is that they didn't want to run the story. So I told them, Mr. Halpern? If you have irrefutable proof and you have anything tangible indicating that you have that proof, I'd like to look at it. And then if it meets the editorial and journalism guidelines of my news sites, I will offer you a forum to tell your story. Don't worry about taking the hits. Let me worry about that. He came on the show and he subsequently began to reveal exactly what was going on in the nursing homes of New York State and throughout the country, including revealing how Governor Cuomo, former Governor, Governor Cuomo, had issued a directive indicating that COVID-19 hospital patients were to be sent to nursing homes. Really? Now, when that, when from the G-Man broke, when the G-Man interviews broke that story, we were attacked six ways to Sunday. I was called a hack journalist. I was called somebody that didn't report the facts, that these were all lies. But subsequently what happened, the former administration, including the governor himself, the former governor, had come forward and admitted, yes, we, the mandate was in fact issued. Now, maybe, you know, they danced around it all after that. But the fact remains, Mr. Halpern's revelations were confirmed. Now and there, my report was confirmed. There was also another person who actually confirmed during one of your interviews that you released that that eventually made his way to the New York Times that you were the first one to break the story. That, that's Mr. Alper. Yes, we did a follow up interview where he just made another discovery, another um, situation that he broke on my podcast regarding the former New York State Director of uh, New York State Department of Health Director. Dr. Howard, um, I'm sorry, last name is Kishman, uh, Howard Katz, I think, maybe. Um, I'm sorry. But at any rate, he was a former director of the New York State Department of Health and came to me. We broke another story. In basically, long story short, that story involved how the then Department of State Director, Department of Health Director, was um, allegedly operating in tandem with Governor Cuomo to send. I believe non-COVID patients to have them become evicted from nursing homes and placed into into public shelters. Are you serious? Yes, because the nursing homes received money. They received <clears throat> money and funding to receive COVID patients. So, in other this words, is a secret. this is the dirty little. I mean, there, there's a lot. Like, yeah, the report is on the new version of the news site uh, from the G Man because, uh, and if I can backtrack just a little, the 
original version of my new site was mysteriously and explicably removed from the internet in 2020. Shortly after a report was published about former Attorney General William Barr. And really, it was about how his Department of Justice had dispatched special agents to, I believe, it was an area in Tennessee, the, city, the location of Casey right now. But they basically had dispatched these agents into this particular area of Tennessee, which was predominantly white. And the reason why they had done this is because they were pulling people aside, usually young people, pulling them to the side, going to their jobs, going to their homes, and they were investigating them. Why? Because the majority of them were helping set up Black Lives Matter chapters in their locations, which again was predominantly white. Really? Five, five hours later, my news site was removed from the internet. And it's 11 year catalog of news reporting, special features, and so on. Did that you in, did you never got back? I'm sorry, say that again. Did you lost? Did you couldn't recover? At the time, at the time. But I don't just take things like that lying down. Uh, initially, yes, I was very, very depressed. I was distraught for quite some time. This happened in, again, June of 2020. I immediately contacted Google, because Google was the host site for Blogger, which is what the original version of From the G-Man was on. And I tried to get information from them. I submitted to at least five queries. And Google better not say otherwise, because I've got, as the kids say, I've got receipts. I got email for everything dating back to 15 years. Okay, so I can track every one of those emails that I sent to, to Google trying to get information. Why was the site removed? What's going on? Did I, if there was some kind of violation, Google had a responsibility to let me know so that I could have made a correction or we could have had some type of corrective action could have been taken. I never got that. I never got a course, any correspondence to this day from Google as to why the new site was removed. Shortly after it was removed, several people contacted me specifically people from the Jewish community. And what I'm about to say is extremely important. They contacted me because they, my new site catered to everyone. Although we cover a, cover a lot of issues that involve people of color, we try to cover news that affects everybody. And that includes the Jewish community. Mm -hmm. So I, were, I published press releases from the Stephen Louise and Paul Center, um, Southern Poverty Law Center, among a host of others. And Jewish organizations submit information to me as well. <clears throat> and the Council of Jewish, um, Jewish Council of Public Affairs is another one that comes to mind. So I started getting contacted by people from the Jewish community and said, hey, we, we know that you run a lot of stuff regarding our community, but we, what happened to your news site? We logged on and we didn't see anything. <sighs> and I was forced to tell them what had actually happened, that I had no explanation as to why it happened, and I apologized to them. They were furious. They were like, what? And I was like, yeah. So they said, okay, this is unacceptable. We don't know what's going on. We don't know why it's happening, but you don't deserve this. What do you need? And you said, you just was Google? I said, yeah, this is Google. So just said, what are you going to do? I said, at this point, I don't know because I don't have, I can't afford a private server because um, that's the only other option that I have. Buy a server that nobody can control but me, and I do my own thing from there. And they're like, well, how much is the server? I said, I don't have, they said, we didn't ask you that. How much do you need? We'll cover it. And it was deeply, deeply touching to me because, and Lloyd, I'm going to go here at the risk of getting in all kinds of trouble and pissing a lot of people off. I sent out an email blast the minute the site was removed to elected officials in Harlem, community movers and shakers in Harlem seeking some type of help. I even sent it to lawyer Benjamin Crump, explaining in detail what had happened and how I need help because they removed my new site without explanation or warning, and no one seems to care to give me an explanation as to why. But I suspect now that since subsequent reports have come out indicating that Google is now being sued on a number of levels for racial discrimination, 
against its employees and business practices. Interesting. I would think that's enough to make anybody say, okay, let's take a look and see what they did to this brother and why. Okay. But it got better because after the new site was taken down, the webmaster from my site now, the 2.0 version, discovered something. Turns out, from the G-Man was shadow banned as well. Hold up, was shadow banned what? I didn't get that last part. It, it, it was shadow banned as well. Uh-huh. Shadow banned meaning people couldn't find it if they punched it in the search engines. A Google search engine, you typed in from the G-Man, it wouldn't come up. Really? So we began to look at, we'll see how many other sites that this was, how many other search engines this was happening to. It was happening to a number of them, but Google being the most prominent. And we've got a paper trail. We've got evidence that Google was doing this. We have hard evidence, which I was willing to submit, again, to Ben Crump and anybody that was interested in looking at it. Nobody seemed to care. Forget the fact that I've been running this news site for over a decade, providing important news and information to all communities, but most importantly to communities of color, and they didn't even seem to care. I have a couple of questions too. One, first of all, uh, uh, one of the uh, viewers chimed in, uh, Brother Francis Revels Bay. He says, what is the most exciting event that you involved in as a journalist to this date? Exciting event? Yeah, what was the most exciting event? In other words, covering something for you. Don't uh, forget everybody's definition of excitement isn't necessarily the same. For right. you, for example, you broke a number of of first runs that major newspapers mm -hmm. picked up later on. Mm -hmm. Did any of that bring you any excitement? And if so, which one was it per se? Does that make sense, G-Man? There are so many since I launched from the G-Man in 2009 that I could cite. Um, but I think the one that, if I had to point to one, it would probably be the case of the late Naomi Davis. And she is? Now, Miss, Miss Davis, she passed away several, a couple of years ago. But I did a special report on her after being contacted by her daughter, <clears throat> uh, Monica Arroyo. And Miss Arroyo had informed me of the fact that her mother had been abused for years by home health aides. And I said, well, that's a pretty strong allegation, Ms. Horn. Do you have, not Mr. Royal, do you have any substantial evidence? To, I have all the evidence that you need. I've got it on videotape. She sent me the videotapes. I looked at them and I was appalled at what I saw. So I had her on the GMAT interviews, not once, but twice. And not only did I have her on to tell her story, I published the videos. Or anybody that dared to refute what she was saying or the allegations or the claim that she was making. You couldn't do it with the video right there. It's right there for you to look at. You can see for yourself. Just to give you an example of one of the atrocities, her mother suffered from dementia and Alzheimer's. Okay. They were sending people to her home that couldn't even communicate with her. Never mind the fact that she suffered from Alzheimer's, Alzheimer's and dementia. They were sending people who only spoke Russian to care for her or a language that where she couldn't even communicate with them. So if she was in some type of medical distress, the home health care aide couldn't communicate with, with her to find out what was wrong because they didn't speak English. And I'm not saying there are only certain people should have a certain job. That's not what I'm saying. I'm saying if you know that you're catering to a community that's predominantly black, Okay, and they only speak English, why would you send somebody who only speaks Russian to care for someone? That's one of the videos that was shown. It also shows a video where one of the home health aides takes the camera, turns it around, and you can hear her clearly going through a purse that was left in close proximity. So having said all that, released that report, and subsequently, subsequently what ended up happening was Ms. Arroyo was called into a meeting with the New York State Attorney General to discuss the reporting. 
and to discuss the special report. Well, let me ask you this. Um, you must have an amazing staff to do all of this investigative reporting. Tell us about your staff. I have no staff. What do you mean you I have no staff? I haven't had a staff in, since I launched the site in 2009, 13 years. Wait I've a minute. Done everything, I've done everything myself. You're saying all of this groundbreaking reporting that has also been picked up from New York Times and other major news organs that you initiated and started, you did not have a staff at all? This has been a yeah. one-man operation? Is one that what you're telling me? One man operation since I launched it, and that's for two reasons. One, I don't have the funding. I can't because I don't believe in bringing people on and not being able to pay them for their services. If people are going to work, they ought to be compensated for their services. That's one. I didn't have the funding. When I tried to get funding, I was turned down by a number of organizations because I am not a non for profit and I'm a one man operation. They only give money to be to nonprofits that are staffed with a significant number of people. So I just got to a point where I said, you know what? Fine. I'm not going to let that stop me because I know, and I had, it was already being shown to me. People are coming to me. People trust me. And I'm not going to let them down. If they've got stories to tell, then damn it, I'm going to tell them. And I'm not going to let the fact that I don't have any money stop me. The fact that I don't have community support stop me. The fact that I've been threatened by numerous entities stop me, and they haven't. Yes, they I do know that news reporters can <laughs> be at risk, especially when they are getting too close either to the source of the truth or anything like that. Um, that's that's interesting. Well, let me say this. Um, at this point, uh, at the bottom of the screen, folks, is everything you need to know about Gary G. Man Toms. I, I call him a journalist extraordinary. Now you see why I call him extraordinary. The fact that he does all of this by himself. And what didn't you also reveal something about the woman that falsely accused Emmett Till? Yes, <clears throat> excuse me. Yes, I did. That um, involved my special guest, Mr. Scott Shepard. Scott Shepard was the former national leader of the Omerta Knights of the Ku Klux Klan. Now, when I featured Mr. Shepard on my podcast of G-Man interviews, I did so because I had done a number of investigative reports on the white nationalist movement for the better part of 10 years. And I've interviewed and met written stories about some of the most prominent members of the movement, such as um, the late Tom Metzger, yes. who founded the White Aryan Resistance. I've interviewed Jeff Scoop, who was the national leader of the National Socialist Movement for more than 30, for close to 30 years, okay? And that's how I met Daryl, I'm sorry, that's how I met Scott Shepard and a host of others. And Scott, when I met Scott and we talked, I said, um, would you be willing to come on my show and just have a, a conversation about what you know regarding the Mattel case? Because Mr. Shepard was very, very close to the Bryant family. And Carolyn Bryant Dunham, as you know, is the woman at the center and the heart of the Emmett Till, the Till murder case. And he came on and he made some very storming revelations that had never been made public before, including the fact that Carolyn Bryant Dunham had a history of doing questionable things in that store and flirting with not just Emmett Till, but a number of black boys who came into that store. Interesting. So that story was eventually submitted to the Department of Justice with the hopes of them looking into or reopening the case. Um, they eventually did. But I cannot say that from the G-Man of the G-Man interview was the reason why they did. But ultimately, they recently closed the case and they have in charge Ms. Bryant with any involvement in the case. But having said that, I just read a report a couple of days ago that the Till family is still pushing hard to find to find a way to be, to have her charged or anybody that was in connection with the crime be charged. So they had, the family hasn't given up the fight. But yeah, Scott came on, I had him on, and like I said, it, so I think to this day, it's still the number one trending story on my, from the G, on GMAT interviews YouTube page. And you've done a boatload of them too, buddy, okay? Yeah, uh, but unfortunately, Lloyd, 
a lot of the reports that I did on the white nationalist movement, this is my other issue with Guru. A lot of the reporting that I did on the white nationalist movement, especially as a black journalist in this country, okay? Because these guys, I mean, don't get me wrong. There were people that I contacted that I wanted to have on the show specifically to talk about the quote-unquote Rahoa, which is the racial holy war that so many in the white nationalist movement are hoping for. Um, that's why I reached out to them, because I wanted to know more about this and find out what it was going to entail, how it was going to be launched in the whole night. So in reaching out to them, there were people who said, who blatantly hung up on, I don't talk to niggers, and slammed the phone down on me. But there were those, like Jeff Scoop, who came on the show, and at the time, even though he was still largely involved in the movement, that during our conversations, there were things that led me to, be led me to believe he's not going to be in the movements. There's something going on here that I'm hearing when we're doing these interviews where he's relating to me one-on-one, -on -one, man to man it's not about color 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 is nowhere here we're two men having a conversation and it was only later like i said maybe a year ago where i had an honest conversation with jeff and he said yeah i, I really think that there there's there's some truth to that i think so because we did become close and i told you things that i haven't told a lot of people so um so long story short that's <clears throat> how Scott ended up on the show. And to this day, I've done, I still continue to do special reports on the white nationalist movement, and but more specifically, Patriot Front, because they pose a very significant danger going forward. And I would urge very, a lot of people to be vigilant. Now, what is the name of this group again? The Patriot what? Patriot Front, F-R-O-N-T. There have been several news reports about them. And the most recent involved them traveling to pencil um, to philadelphia pennsylvania philadelphia okay um and they took part in a rally walking right down the middle of pennsylvania like they owned the place but they were eventually chased out and uh but that just gives you an idea of how bold this group is and what they're willing to do they were also charged with um or alleged to have um, defaced or damaged um, George Floyd uh, murals and memorials here in New York, and I forget the other location, but there were two locations where they proudly proclaimed that they were involved with that. So this is how bold they are. That, that's my whole point. They, they're willing to go the extreme, and even Jeff Scoop has admitted, yeah, these are the people you need to watch out for going forward. Wow. If you, if you didn't think it was one thing, it seems to be another, huh? Yeah. Yeah. That's where we are right now, unfortunately, in this country. But well, let me say this. Uh, I, I want to do this. Uh, uh, my guest, my very special guest, and and a very good friend of mine, and a long time friend. We've been knowing each other for a couple of decades. Okay, he's been always been consistent. He's been a man of truth. If you are afraid to have hard questions asked, I would say do not go to Gmail. He's <laughs> not the one. Okay, but that's how you roll, though. But that's why. You have, and imagine had you been a white journalist, independent, seemed like you would have been swooped up by, to have, have any major news organ when you broke all these major stories, and there have been quite a few too. Have any of them ever reached out to say, listen, why don't you join the ranks? Or won't you hire your services? Or yes, you can be independent, but we can still maybe fund some of the things you do or underwrite some of the costs for your investigative reporting? I've contacted every major news organization in this country. I've submitted most of my news reports, the big stories that I broke, including the story about Governor Cuomo issuing that mandate that COVID-19 hospital patients be sent to nursing homes. Mm -hmm. I sent that to NBC, ABC, CBS, you name it. I'm going down the line. Yes, I'm calling stations. You got mad, you're going to get mad, get mad. The truth is the truth. I'm not here to hide anything. Okay, I've got nothing to lose at this point, especially if somebody is getting threatened. Nobody's coming forward to help me. So you know what? The hell with it. Gloves are coming off. I sent my reports to as many that I thought would take interest in it and would possibly issue me some form of support. At the very least, because there are a number of organizations that do this, ProPublica, 
collaborates with Foods and Traditions Organization. PDS um, collaborates with ProPublica. I mean, this, this is what they do if they lack the resources to get the story out there the way that they want to get it out and put it out there then you team with someone. And so when I submitted these reports, it was with the hope that that would happen. Never happened, never did follow up reports. The only thing that did happen was subsequently, I'd say maybe after a couple of weeks, they would they printed something that confirmed what was in from the G-Man or the G-Man interviews report. So either way, Six Ways of Sunday, I've been vindicated. Yeah, uh, I was going to say that you seem to eventually come out on top where eventually these these really uh, stories that you break eventually become, you know, like topics of conversations anytime you're picking up a major organ like Times or whatever the case is. So somebody knows something that whatever. And one of the things is this, too, that... Um, you have been involved with Ukraine before it became Ukraine that's in the news now. Yes. Can you just talk about that in a second? And then there's a question I wanted to ask you too, which is, I did not know there was a strong African presence in Ukraine and what are happening to those brothers. But uh, first things okay. first, because we're, we're wrapping up in a, in a couple of, but I just wanted to let people know that you've been on Ukraine before Ukraine became the news that it is now. I started reporting on Ukraine in 2015, which was a year after Russia had invaded and annexed Crimea. And it's funny because a number of people who look back at the, um, the record of news reports regarding Ukraine that I've done, and one of my friends nicknamed me the Nostradamus of news <laughs> because he said, wait, <clears throat> dude, you're a brother operating the hood. <laughs> yes, you why do. The hell, why the hell were you focusing on Ukraine when nobody else, I mean, it was on the radar, but nobody was reporting it on the way that you were. I said, because there was something that told me this is a story that's going to be a lot bigger than what people understand. And I started reading publications, news publications and looking at news, televised news reports. And I saw something that was kind of disturbing. I saw this reporting that was done, being done on Ukraine, but nobody had you, members of the Ukrainian community or Ukrainian journalists on to share their perspectives. And I was like, that just didn't make any sense to me. So I contacted the editor of the Ukrainian Weekly because this was, that's just how I operate. And I try to have the best of the best on my show okay i only have the no that's experts. normally your style i'm here to testify that's how you roll basically if you're going to do it you do it well thank you i appreciate that so um they came on the show and really they jumped at the opportunity because oh finally somebody that's willing to let me come on and really express what's going on in ukraine as somebody who not only worked in the ukrainian government understands the government understands the policies understands the people and the culture to come on the show and provide, uh, from a news perspective, a journalist perspective, what I've recovered, what I've uncovered, and where this has the potential to go. And like I said, in a seven-year track record, so you can just go log on, listen to the interviews that I've done with, with these people, where you will see they were sounding the warning alarm as early as seven years ago. For whatever reason, it was never really given the attention that it deserved including by, according to the um, Matthew DeBoss, who's the editor of the Ukrainian Weekly, he pointed out how there even several administrations did not do their due diligence in terms of really looking into and understanding the situation in Ukraine and the potential of that to get really, really, really bad. And look where we are now. Everything that they said, Matthew DeBoss, Askel Krushelinski, who, by the way, is actually serving as a correspondent for From the G-Man on the ground in Ukraine as we speak right now. And I think, and somebody can please feel free to contact my office if I'm wrong, I believe From the G-Man and the G-Man interviews is the only Black-owned, independent, unfunded news site in the country that has a man on the ground in Ukraine. And we are awfully proud of that. 
scared as hell because I don't want anything to happen to him. This guy is a prince. He's a principal guy and a hell of a journalist. In fact, the journalist has already been killed, or one or two already, from what I, mean, I understand, what little news date, I hear nowadays. Well, to date, three have, but that's three that we're aware of. There could be a lot more that we aren't aware of. Well, in the remaining minutes, I did not know that there was a strong African community there. And because uh, yes. one was... Uh, where there's some trains was loading up Ukrainians, but they were leaving the Africans off the train. What's up with what's up with our African brothers over there? That is true. That is very very true. As a matter of fact, when the report from the G-Man picked up the report on March first, and we picked it up from the Huffington Post, and so once I read the report, and I was naturally I was blown away. So I says, Oh no 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 no! Hold on hold on hold on! So I went online, and because I needed to confirm the report, I wanted to see how many other news organizations outside of America were reporting this, because that's another way that I gauge how valid the story is. It's not just published here in America. Let's see where else it is. Is it on Global News? Is it on France 24 English? Is it on Al Jazeera? So I go down the line, and I see the reports, which confirm, so I said, okay, now what I've got to do is find out, because if this particular story focused on Nigerians in Ukraine that weren't allowed, that weren't allowed to cross the Polish border, or let alone allowed to get on the trains to evacuate from Ukraine, right? Mm -hmm. So I was up all night because if I have to do that, that's what I do. And I said maybe about three or four hours, I was working working the internet, and I came across a Nigerian newspaper and what it had was a video from a um, nigerian organization where its chairwoman was giving specific instructions uh specific four specific points that nigerians can use border points where they can flee ukraine so i'm looking i'm like this is amazing why isn't anybody running this so i took the video and I immediately published it on from the G-Man, and I it just it just took off from there. People were like, "Oh my God! I thank you so much! I can't believe because we had no idea. My loved ones, they have no idea. I can give this to my loved ones. This is amazing. Thank you, thank you, thank you." But all it took was just a couple of hours, man. That's all it took. If you really want to find the information, if you really care about doing the story right or putting the information out there, put the time into it. You will find it. And then just provide it to the people because as is the case in this situation they were stuck in a dangerous situation and in all reality let's just say the russians had in, in full and in fully infiltrated ukraine and i'm only going by the reporting that i've done in the past to cite this chances are the first people they would have targeted would have not only been ukrainians they would have killed the africans why Be because in russia there is an enormous white nationalist contingency. And I posted a report on the original version, the original site from the G-Man, okay, that was on Blogger, which is owned by Google, where I interviewed someone who was from Russia. And they said, I want to come on your show. I want to talk about this because this is really, really bad and has potential to get worse. He sent me video footage that he got off what was, well, now it's known as the dark web. But he went underground because that's what these organizations do. These neo-Nazi organizations, they publish videos underground of what they're doing and whom they're doing it to. And there were actual murders of Africans. And they were killing them because they didn't want, quote unquote, foreigners in their land. But you know what's interesting? They never heard of Alexander Pushkin that transformed <laughs> the, the language into a dignified Russian language? Obviously not, Lloyd. Who, and by the way, Obviously for those who are not familiar with Alexander Pushkin, he was a man of color, a black man. So yes. I guess, yes. let us just get a little history straight up in this piece, okay? Right, right. Um, that's amazing. Well, let me tell you this. Our time is up, but you see at the bottom of the screen, my guest has been Gary G. Man Tom, journalist extraordinary. That's why I put extraordinary because 
He has you're broken. You're too kind, Lloyd. You're too kind. Thank you. I but it's that. true. I, at least I'm talking, telling the truth. Okay. <laughs> uh, Lectra, uh, his email is from the G Man at Proton, Proton Mail. Is that how it's pronounced? Yes, from the G Man at ProtonMail.com. That's my email address as well as the address for my PayPal account if anyone would be kind of. No, no, I'm, I'm going to get to that. Trust me. Oh, okay. Trust okay, me. I'm trust sorry. me. I'm, I'm heading I'm there because everybody knows on my show how I feel about. PayPal and the people that put themselves out there without, uh, do you have any 401ks, uh, G-Man? No, I do not. Do you have any uh, pensions? No, I do not. Do you have any funding? No, I do not. That's why we're putting your PayPal on here, okay? <laughs> That's all I'm saying no, to you, buddy. Uh, anyway, uh, for those who have news stories that affect the community, that affects the world, this is his office number, 973-530-7658. I mean, seriously, folks, anything that's affecting our community, affecting this world in the sense, the one thing I will say about G-Man, he doesn't play. If you're not ready to tell the truth, he goes hard. He goes deep. I'm, I'm telling you from my years of knowing him, he is a man of integrity. He's a man that really takes being a journalist seriously and not just in words. Uh, and his uh, news site is uh, from the gman.net and his PayPal, his PayPal, please notice, he's doing all these late breaking stories by himself. I just knew you had a staff of about at least five or six people, G-Man. No, for 13 years, it's been only me, Lloyd. That's why so many people that I've spoken to in and out of journalism, they, they don't believe it. They're like, there's no way in hell one man can do if you you because you're writing the news stories i'm sure you get press releases from all over the place that and i say yeah and i have to rewrite them because i sometimes i look at these press releases and i can't believe people are being paid big money to write stuff like this and i'll have to re-edit edit it or um i bet all of my guests i bet all of yeah you do guests. you vetted me a couple of times when i was on your show i mean and we I, boys too okay I, I, book, I book my guests i conduct the interviews I edit, direct. I'm wearing a, a million hats, but you know what? I'm still standing despite the threats that I continue to get. And nothing's going to stop me because I realize, as one of my dear friends said, this is my anointing. And once you realize what you're put here to do, and you're doing it, as you always say, you're doing it in truth. You're speaking in truth and walking in truth. Yep. There's nothing to be afraid of. Yeah, yeah. And we only come this way once, G-Man. That's absolutely We only right. come this way once, and that's how we roll with this. Uh, his PayPal is from the G-Man at protonmail.com. Please get, if you don't read any other part of this banner, you make sure you get that last line straight that says PayPal and donate, please. Don't. Don't be talking about, well, how come he didn't do this and how come he didn't do that? Because my question is, what did you do? Because wow. if you ain't doing nothing, then it's all just conversation. And this That's let me, wrong. give me, can you spare, is it free, has really got to stop when it comes to us. Because we are starving in the midst of plenty. So I'm just saying, because I know this man very well, and not because he interviewed me, and in my interviews, some of my forecasts came out correct, thank you. But mm -hmm. the fact mm -hmm. that he questioned me, not did not, and we've been knowing each other. He questioned me just like I just met him. It's like, yo, G, what's up, man? You know? <laughs> so I see where G man come from, but. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I said, you know what? I would probably, probably interrogate my mother. To get the chance. <laughs> just, no, no, you roll hard, brother. You yeah, take yeah. your journalism seriously. And for that, we are all to be very thankful for it because at least somewhere out here, somebody's getting at the truth of it and it might as well be gary g man toms that's all i can say gary god bless you man and uh you take good care of yourself and i'm going to i've got some to make some announcements for the for next week um, no for later on this week to be honest with you but please before i get off that's gary g man toms journalist extraordinary lecturer email is from the g man at protomail.com his news office, please, if anything that affects you directly, indirectly, what's going on that you see that should be a public notice, give him a call. He will look into it. He will make the calls. He will do this. I know for a fact he's done it. And his number is 973-530-7658.
and his new site uh, is from HTTPS from the gman.net. So go to his website and see some of his reporting. It's really awesome. But more importantly, for man that's doing this solo, do you know how much folks it takes probably to do an investigation, what it costs in terms of equipment, computers, whatever, research? And he's doing this on his own. So please uh, support him through his PayPal from the gman at protomail.com. And I will shut my mouth but right now that's what you'll do okay g man thank, you, thank you very very much man and you take really good care of yourself too and i mean that sincerely all right thank you lord i greatly appreciate it and i thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak on your platform because for the first time in over two decades um someone in the media of, of someone of your status somebody of great status has given me an opportunity to speak and, and share my story no one has including the mainstream media or any other media outlet so I really thank you for that. I don't know what they're afraid of, G-Man. Okay? You don't bother yeah, nobody. You, know, you just get to the bottom of it. That's all. Can I, okay, well, real, brief, real briefly, I'll respond to that. Yes. Everyone's afraid of what they can't control. Uh, that is true. And I know for a fact you're not controllable. No. I cannot be bought. I won't be bought. And a lot of people have come to realize that and understand that. And that's not going to change with me. People can come to me and offer me all kinds of money. Oh, let me buy your site. Well, we can we can collaborate, but it's got to be under the right conditions. I'm not giving it away for free. This is mine. I created it. I'm not just going to hand it to somebody, especially if you've got malicious intent, like to use it to either defame, destroy, or diminish people of color. That ain't happening. Again. Amen. Amen. It's, we're not down with none of that, G-Man. That There we go. <laughs> we're on the same page on a lot of issues. Anyway, G-Man, this has been wonderful. Thank you, thank you, thank you for taking your valuable time. And hopefully for those fledgling or journalists of the future that wants to know really what a real journalist is about and what journalism is about and seeking its truth, this is the man you need to call. And in fact, before I close, wasn't you just given some position for a, a Black news organization, if I'm not mistaken? Yes, I'm proud to announce that I've been accepted into the National Association of Black Journalists, which is a dream come true of mine because one of my, I'm sorry, a couple of days ago, what was the anniversary of his passing? Let's pain. March 19th, yeah. Let's pain, yeah. And he was a, he was a co-founder. And one of the greatest compliments I'll ever get, and I'll never get a higher compliment, he had said before his death that he considered from the G-Men very impressive in concept design and execution. This is, so this is a man who won a Pulitzer Prize for journalism and regard, was regarded as one of the greatest. <laughs> uh, Gary, thank you so, so much, man. I didn't... I should have I should have just kept quiet, but I just wanted people to really realize the the level of your expertise, the level of your experiences, and to recognize you for the many, many things you've done that uh which is why you do what you do and you do it well. God bless you. It's okay, it's okay Lord. No need to apologize. It's just that he was my advisor, he was my friend, and he really believed in what I was doing, even though I was doing it alone. And he also complimented you that you were one of the few that really knew how to interview him when you did. Yes, he did. He did. Yeah, see, I pay attention to you, G-Man. Okay? <laughs> I pay attention Thanks, to you. Thanks, man. Appreciate it. Thank okay, you. Okay, love you much, buddy. You take good care of yourself, too. Take care, everybody. Stay safe out there, all right? All righty. I'm sure they will. We don't have too much of a choice. Everybody? <laughs> that was great. G-Man, thank you so much. God bless you, buddy. Thank you, Lord. Thank you. Uh, everybody? Okay, that was that was awesome, as far as I'm concerned. Uh, listen, uh, Wednesday? Okay, we're going to have this distinguished gentleman on. His name is Lorenzo Sanford. Okay, he has been on our show before. He has put out a book. Okay, this is his book that he's going to be talking about. And uh, we're looking forward to him. So for everybody, yes, we're going to do readings, all that. So if you notice, I have non-metaphysical people on, but I want to try to make all this as well-rounded as much as possible. And so don't forget to 
uh, pick up the monthly newsletter. It is absolutely free. All you got to do is go to lloyd-strayhorn.com to get your free monthly newsletter. It don't cost a dime. And if not, uh, you can also visit this person here, my associate that we write together. Hers it says Kaya and Lloyd. Mine says Lloyd and Kaya. But the point is either go to kayafrench.com and sign up for the free monthly newsletter for those of you who support her and follow her and all those other things. So this is the monthly newsletter that is done and each and every time and on this coming Thursday, I will be doing another Clubhouse. It's, it's very interesting of trying to articulate something that is hard without some visualization, but it's, it's an interesting challenge. It's an interesting challenge. So everybody, I want to thank you very, very much. And so again, this is my guest on Wednesday, the very distinguished out of Atlanta, Lorenzo Sanford. Um, and everybody, hold on one second. Let me do this. Okay. Everybody, y'all take good care of yourselves, okay? And I hope this was, I hope this was a very informative show this evening about what it takes to do when you're gonna do a job well good and report the facts for what it is and not what you feel it is. That's not the journalism of, of the day he comes from. So everybody, I want you to have a very, very nice day. I want you all to take good care of yourselves. And I will see you on Wednesday in a matter of days. Bye. Whoops, here we go. One thing about live television, I mean, yeah, or live streaming now, but this is it. Bye bye. All right, signing off. Really? Okay. <laughs>